what um, I'm hoping to do today is to present some larger ideas and then um, hopefully backed up with um, some evidence from this um, book that I'm working on now, which is um, uh, Life and Death During the Long War, uh, China and Taiwan, 1937 to 1959. And this is a book that looks at, it's a study of um, wartime displacement and community formation, starting with the Second Sino-Japanese War and um, continuing through the Civil War, the Chinese Civil War, and then um, going through the early Cold War period. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, looking in, at a couple of, a few different particularly localized case studies of um, communities in East China, in Southwest China, um, where uh, many of, much of the population of East China fled during the war with Japan, um, back in East China during the Civil War, and then in Taiwan um, after 1949, to look at ideas of home. Um, and increasingly, I've been focusing on ideas also of communities created with the, by the living, but in, um, in congruence with and in, um, together with the dead. And this has come up in a number of different ways, one of which was the collaborative project that Emily uh, mentioned, this, um, this conference, which is turning in also into a book called The Social Lives of Dead Bodies in Modern China, um, which is a, a project with, um, of historians and anthropologists and scholars from other fields that have, uh, are trying, we're trying to look, move from frameworks just of commemoration or symbol or trauma and really look at, at um, the dead as social actors in uh, history and in particular mm -hmm. social frameworks. And this has sort of influenced me to look at my own work in a slightly different light. And it's also been a, a, a process of prompting me to think about a methodological problem um, or two and its a uh, way of solving that. And that's um, the methodological problem, and maybe it's a, slight, it's a bit of an ethical problem too, is um, when one is looking at, at um, war and wartime displacement, how does one talk about loss? Um, and how, how do you respect loss? Um, and how does one do it in an era when war is increasingly mediated? Um, and it's especially the experience of the refugee is increasingly mediated. And I'll come back to this, um, the historical framework uh, under which this photo was, particular photo was taken later uh, towards the end of my talk. But I think this is a, a one of many such examples of this mediation. And it's not just a local mediation or a national mediation, but it's a global mediation. Um, so during a time period uh, of total war, when total war demands the mobilization and the politicization of civilians, um, and also during a time of world war, um, which, in which atrocities are depicted um, through writing, but increasingly also through film and photography, um, but, and uh, these are media which appear to uh, bring us closer, but also as, um, not only Susan Sontag, but many others have noted as a, a process that also can distance us. Um, how do we respond to the suffering of others? And this has been a, you know, I, I think about this a lot when I think about wartime China, which is a problem that is ongoing. Um, it's a problem that, you know, if you look at the, the pages of the newspaper, um, we know that this is still a, an issue that is being, um, deployed in, um, for a number of different reasons in the, in the uh, diplomacy right now between uh, China and Japan and, the, and involving the US, involving the Korea and so on. So we can think of um, even unbidden without my having to put them up a number of iconic images of China during, um, during World War II, during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Um, the baby abandoned on the, track, the, on the railroad tracks in Shanghai. Um, the uh, 
naked corpses of the city of Nanjing during the Nanjing massacre. Then um, these have all become fixed in our minds and our memories, but do they, how much um, uh, personhood do they have? How much uh, narrative do they have? How much do we know about these images? And um, this particular photo also represents uh, a, the sort of intersection of all these spaces. This is a uh, photograph from the first Taiwan Strait crisis in 1954 and 55. Um, so the first um, battle for offshore islands between the nationalist forces uh, on Taiwan, Chiang Kai-shek's forces and um, Mao's forces, and, and the large-scale involvement from the U.S. 7th Fleet, um, which was deployed to evacuate 18,000 residents of uh, these offshore islands to Taiwan um, upon the loss of the nationalist, uh, the nationalist forces. And as you can see from the, the photograph, um, American photographers were there and Life magazine, among other uh, US media outlets, were instrumental in depicting this, partly because the US government actually had, took a very um, large monetary and political role in depicting the plight of these refugees as a fight against communism, as a uh, political and propaganda statement against communism. Um, and so this was not the first instance, and nor would it be the last, of the um, use of refugees as um, a political, um, to make a political point. Um, but what I find is um, that the depiction of grief, or actually the actuality of grief, and the actuality of, um, of death and bodies causes us to... Um, to pause, and even through photographs, we can see a, an encounter through, um, through dialogue and through ritual, which can um, destabilize this political relationship or this mediated relationship. Um, and it can help us also get away from the, um, the methodological problem of writing. Um, because in the many accounts that have come out to rectify the problem of the lack of voices of refugees in China's war, um, which have, you know, there's, there's been a lot of historical reclamation work very good in um, the past number of years. One of the issues is the refugee voices still are uh, elite voices by and large. Um, they're intellectuals, they're reporters, they're students who have moved from East China to Southwest China. Um, so you have um, a, a sense of uh, a displaced elite um, who are writing about partly about their senses of being culturally displaced um, from the cultural centers of China, from Beijing, from Shanghai, to a place they consider to be um, culturally less than, um, as well as being displaced by war. Um, so thinking about ritual helps us possibly to get out of that framework. The other one is thinking about analytical frameworks overall. Um, the focus in studies of um, wartime experience on trauma, um, I'm not sure that, that, I'm finding that they don't necessarily fit well with what I'm empirically finding out for the China case. Meaning the idea of the kind of writing of, um, loss and um, confessional, confession of trauma is not easily um, deduced from the kinds of writing or the kinds of memory that we find from people who went through the war in China. Very, very often talking to people whose parents or grandparents uh, lived through this time, um, people will say, well, you know, we, they just don't talk about it. And this is, this is true of many places and times um, in North America as well as China, but it's particularly so in China. And so um, that doesn't mean that um, these experiences were not, um, did not involve pain and loss, but we need to find a better, uh, or at least a different framework. Um, and so this leads me to think about the framework of, um, of ritual, 
um, as a way of, uh, or as an inclusion in the history of migration and diaspora. Now this should not be necessarily, um, and also of wartime experience, this should not come as a surprise to people who work on, and the people in this room who have worked on, the history of Chinese migration and diaspora at all you know, in, in other contexts, because they in, that includes, in a very large portion, the need to, um, to move the dead as well as to move the living. Um, people like, um, like Elizabeth Sin's new book, for example, on um, overseas Chinese in Hong Kong have pointed out the role of the Donghua Hospital, this uh, very large and powerful charity in Hong Kong, as a place that uh, would not only provide medical services, but that served as a place to receive the bones of, um, of migrants to the Sierra, uh, who had lived in the Sierra Mountains in Northern California, who had gone to mine, and whose bodies needed to be brought back to South China. Um, you know, as early as earlier, the earlier part of the 19th century. So that in the sojourning patterns of Chinese um, diaspora and migration, returning home, even after death, is an important part of, um, of the overall patterns of movement. So um, my thought is to integrate the his this history of migration and diaspora with the history of wartime experience, and so to think about the patterns of the movement of the dead, as well as the patterns of the movement of the living refugees. Um, and this comes out a bit in, was prompted a bit also by thinking about some of the texts that I was reading, as well as the photographs. Um, and this is a comment from the experience of the, the, um, the nationalist minority in Taiwan who came to rule over the Taiwanese majority after 1949. Um, and until their sort of um, efforts, eff various efforts to reclaim um, culture in Taiwan in the past 10 years or so, a lot, some of this had been expressed earlier in literature, particularly um, the expression of the less, the less privileged politically and economically privileged part of that mainlander class. So not the Chiang Kai-shek and Song Mei Ling level, um, but the rank and file of the, um, the infantry in the lower levels of uh, the military forces who had gone over um, to Taiwan, who were living in um, in these uh, military, military so-called military dependent compounds, Drensun, um, so who had been allowed perhaps to bring their families with them, or or not even necessarily bring their families with them. So um, one of these fictional depictions of them, but based on um, her own family's experience, um, is the writer, the novelist Zhu Tianxin. Um, and so I'd written one of these short stories, and she, during this time in the 1990s with the rise of Taiwanese native consciousness, um, she wanted to speculate on the, the role and the necessity of these people who had moved in and, and were being pushed back against um, with Taiwanese native consciousness. And she said, well, you know, why don't these people think of Taiwan as home? And she kind of pinned it on this idea that, um, that you know, they had left the graves of their ancestors behind, um, and a number of other things as well. But she wrote this description of the tomb sweeping festival when you, you're supposed to go every spring and clean off tombs and make offerings at the, at the tombs of your family members. And she, she writes this, um, this description about the kids going out and coming home and their parents were acting strangely. Um, some would be burning paper money offerings in the backyard but they didn't, because they did not know whether the relatives back home were alive, because this is before opening up and, con and contact across the street, they could only state ambiguously that the money was burned for ancestors of X family, meaning you can't make an offering for a specific person. It just has to go to a general, um, a generality. Therefore, their expressions were especially complicated. They dare not express grief. Their faces would be marked by memories made all the more lucid and poignant by the passage of time. 
So a land where none of your relatives are buried cannot be called a home. Now this is taking a very general maybe, and maybe essentialized cultural trope um, that home is determined by the burial plots of your family, by your ancestors. But it is an attempt to make a historical specificity about displacement and about this particular group of displaced people um, or people who have been um, actually in this particular group, we can probably call them forcibly migrated because they had been, uh, some of them had been, um, had been forcibly sent along with the armed forces. Some of them had volunteered, but not all of them. And most of them had thought that they were going temporarily. Um, and so it's an attempt to, uh, to express this. And I think if we start to unpack the generality of this trope, we might find some, some actual um, specific evidence. So in my overall study, again, just to give you a visual sense of where I'm looking at. So I'm starting from a couple of sites in, um, in southern Jiangsu province, so near Nanjing, the capital, and then um, a, a, a few other counties nearby between Nanjing and Shanghai. Then moving, um, it's a little, a little light there, but if you can see there, um, to Chongqing, uh, the wartime capital in Sichuan province during the war, then back again during the uh, Civil War, 46 to 49, then to Taiwan, and then these are the offshore islands I mentioned, and back. Um, so during this time, estimates vary on how many um, people were actually displaced, but um, people settle on somewhere around a quarter of the Chinese population um, was, um, was on the move during the war with Japan. We don't know, we have know even less about the Civil War period, but actually quite a few people were also displaced during the Civil War period, and this is extremely poorly understood, partly because that period tends to be narrated through the framework of revolution, um, or particularly through the, na the framework of the fight between the nationalists and the communists, but I think it's also important for us to understand it as a continuation of war for the experience of many people in China. Um, so not necessarily as a political fight per se, but as a continuation of the wartime experience, which is one of the reasons why I want to do this analysis as a long war analysis, as this uh, analysis of punctuated mobilization, that um, there's a sort of continual mobilization of the populace, a continual um, displace, waves of displacement, and that even in the 1950s, during the Cold War period, many people's experience, especially in, in Taiwan, is of a sense of always being possibly mobilized, possibly needing to pick up again and move and go back across the strait and not an uncertainty. Um, and so wartime conditions, in a sense, continue. What this means is that as far as the relationship of the living to the dead, um, some, there are many, many dead who are missing. Um, and particularly the, of course, the military um, dead, um, especially those of the um, many conscripted men who were, um, who were brought in to fight on the nationalist side under very, very poor conditions during the war with Japan. Um, but even um, who by and large were buried where they fell. Um, so that meant for the vast majority of people, and again, this is um, very understudied and poorly understood, um, but for the vast majority of people, this, um, the sense is that if they lost um, a father, a son, a brother during the war, um, they would not receive any physical element of them back to bury. Um, and so there are anecdotal reports of, of rituals being carried out during the war um, to, of um, uh, 
soul calling rituals where where people would hold up pieces of clothing um, and and try to bring back the soul of the person so that they could have a ceremony so the person would not be an actual wandering ghost left uh, you know, because they were they were lost and left on the field um, so my thought is that this makes um, the dead who are known um, both the circumstances of their death are known and their actual location and corpses are known, all the more important. Uh, so what we find then is some very interesting um, examples. And uh, I found a number of documents in the Sichuan, uh, in the Chongqing Municipal Archives in Sichuan that narrated a very a, a, a fascinating um, instance at the very end of the war with Japan. Um, so this starts in what is it, June, July, um, even the end of May, I believe, uh, in 1945. So before the Japanese surrender, but there is thought that the war is coming to a close. Uh, there are a number of native place associations in Chongqing. Now, of course, these are a standard um, social formulation in China that when groups uh, go to another city for business um, or sometimes for government, that they will form an association together with people from their native place, from their native city um, for mutual support, um, for loans, for um, charity, but also importantly for sending bones back, for sending bodies back, um, depending on the locality and the burial ritual. In wartime Chongqing, there were a number of new versions of this. A lot, you know, the Native Place Associations have a long history. A, lo a lot of them had been formed in the Qing Dynasty, but there were new ones that had been formed specifically during the war. Um, so these were not necessarily related to earlier merchant networks. Um, and they were formed of people displaced um, to Chongqing during the war. And the Wuxi in Chongqing Native Place Association was one such. So this is a group of people from eastern China, from Jiangsu province. Um, and so in the summer of 1945, they start planning to send not people back, not live people on boats, but dead people in coffins. Um, and so, uh, and this is, it's, transport is very, very difficult, even after the Japanese surrender. It's a, it's a matter that requires military permits, uh, special negotiation, because this is, transport in the Yangtze River is still seen as a matter of national security. So even before people are able to make their way back to the native place. Bodies are being sent back to the native place for reburial. Um, so this is, starts to be planned out. And the coffins had been, uh, they were of people who had died during the war of various causes, um, most often of, of some kind of illness. They were either older people or children. Occasionally, there were people who had died during air bombing raids um, and whose bodies managed to be recovered rather than the more typical outcome, which would be to be buried in mass graves or to be dumped in the river in Chongqing, which happened to a lot of um, air bombing raid victims. And so, and the, these bodies were, had either been interred in cemeteries in Chongqing or they had been set aside for storage in, the, um, in these native place associations. So, Gradually, these ships go back with, the, um, with coffins aboard. It's a major undertaking to do this also because they have to search long and hard for boatsmen who are willing to do this work because it's, it's, it's um, not a, um, work that many people want to do. They have to pay them extra. Uh, there's a setback along the way when one of the boats crashes and a couple of coffins fall overboard. So the head of the Native Place Association has to go and not only pay actual compensation to the family, but um, really do ritual labor do, do, uh, to make good to that family. But they managed to send several hundred coffins. And the interesting thing is that this is a time, too, that you would think that people who are connected to the nationalist military and government would have 
all the good, the best connections to get themselves back, their family back, or the family of their loved ones. But this Native Place Association is receiving many letters from people who are in the government and in the military sending, saying, my mother died during the war, would you please send her back? Not just to Wuxi, but to all the Jiangsu area towns, to Nanjing, the, ca the capital, um, that would be again the capital, and so on. So there was this real sense that this Native Place Association had a network and an experience and an ability to do something that the government was incapable of doing or unwilling to do, unwilling to put its resources into doing at this point. Um, and there was a real demand. At, at a certain point, the association starts to say, we actually have to start turning people down because we, we want to keep it, they kept it secret at first and then um, others got wind of it and the demand became too much for them to handle. And my thinking at this point is that it's so important and priorities put so high on this because these are known corpses, these are known bodies, and there is so much that is unknown for people at this time that it, be, that it becomes all the more important to care for those who are known, known and those who you can actually do this for, do this ritual labor for, and um, complete this circle. Uh, eventually, the government starts to realize that this something is a priority for people. So uh, within uh, about a year after that, the nationalist government starts to make provision for um, offering um, burial expen ex reburial expenses and some money for certain kinds of civil servants. So railroad workers, um, people who work on ships, and so on, they, will, they offer uh, stipends for and other kinds of civil servants um, because they, they do figure out that this is something that is important. Um, but just again to remind you of the distance involved, so we're talking of moving between that, that very large distance. Um, in Wuxi itself, in the years after, we also see a very interesting um, effort to create a, a moral reconstruction of the, um, of the community. And this is, just to give you some context of the, the place itself, it's very, um, the post-war years, I, I hesitate to call them post-war years because the post-war for the, for the Sino-Japanese Sino War is really the Civil War. It very, almost immediately moves toward, to Civil War in, um, and periodic fighting um, in waves of fighting in 1946, 47, 48. Um, so those years are, um, even if they're, um, they don't involve outright battles between the nationalists and the communists, which are happening in the northern part of the province and sending waves of refugees to a city like, like Wuxi, um, new refugees. They're extremely violent. There's a lot of, of destabilization in these communities. There is just a lot of weaponry left over um, from the Japanese. So when you read the newspapers, there tends to be a violent crime, um, a, even a, a uh, almost every day a murder every, th every two, three days um, in these years, especially in 1946. There's a lot of problem uh, in reintegrating the people who went downriver to, um, to Chongqing um, back into the community because their property, you know, that someone else is living in their house is a really big problem. Um, and the so from that kind of small thing to a larger problem of the people who had stayed behind and lived under the Japanese um, are frequently accused of collaboration and how to deal on a moral level but also a practical level with the people who had remained behind. So there are many efforts to, um, to deal with this on a uh, rhetorical level, a discursive level, as well as a practical level during that time. Um, and one of the ways that this happens is lineages um, engage in a wide-scale rewriting and reprinting of genealogies during 
um, the period, the immediate post-war years, 46, 47, 48. Um, throughout Jiangsu, I would say it's, it's the largest period of lineage addition, new additions since the years immediately following the Taiping Rebellion. So these, these are lineages that have um, many, some of the many additions going back um, you know, to the Ming Dynasty or even earlier, and they will come up with new additions every several generations. But some of them, it's really quite notable that they say, not since this other earlier um, enormous catastrophe in our locality um, have we thought to redo this um, an addition. And to redo an addition is to add new generations, but you also write new biographies, um, lauding the people who are, who are worthwhile in your family for study, but also for heroic acts. And then they have new prefaces that describe the happenings. And so a lot of these prefaces will directly address the war um, and the fate of the family and also address the writing of a genealogy as an act of knitting together what had been spread, what had been scattered. And very often the terminology used is drifting, scattered, this um, Liu San, um, Liu Li, um, scattered, drifting, so this would be one example, um, description of the wartime that um, people had fled to the interior in this kind of disorderly drift. And that it's not just an individual choice, but it also pulled apart family and ritual. And so in us writing the genealogy, rewriting the genealogy, and often concurrently reconstructing the, um, the ancestral hall, the lineage hall, uh, we are going to knit back together what had been scattered. Um, so it's, a, it's a, um, an argument as well as a narrative. Um, and this is repeated quite frequently. Um, and sometimes we find versions that are linked to the nation um, where lineages say, we, we are doing this just like the Chinese people are knitting themselves together. Um, but not always. Sometimes it is seen just as a local act. Um, it's also a way of um, narrating the fate of the people who are left behind under the Japanese. So sometimes it's a way of describing how these people had scattered. But then we also get versions of, um, for example, uh, one from a 1946 genealogy of the Hu lineage. Um, in um, in Shangshang village um, in Wu, uh, Wu count, in Wuxi County, where the description in the preface said that the poor of the county had no way to make a living, um, and so and no guaranteed um, income whatsoever during the war, and a real emphasis on this, which when you read it against some of the accounts of um, uh, especially, for example, in Timothy Brooks' book, Collaboration, of the motivation of some of the, um, the lower level elites in, um, in this part of China to start charities and seek help from the Japanese. A lot of it came from this idea of feeding people or, um, or maintaining economic stability. And, um, and then often they found themselves in very difficult positions. Um, from that, so there's a sense of of justifying the fact of staying, um, even if it doesn't go so far to say as well we collaborated as a result. Um, in in another lineage, however, there's also an attempt to um, to uh, narrate a heroic tale. So there's one. This is a very atypical story to include in a lineage biography. And lineage biographies are usually people who did well in. Um, in earlier times in the civil service examination system, people who, who um, joined the government. But one includes a tale of a bargeman who undertook a smuggling enterprise during the war um, on, on Lake Tai, the very large lake uh, which Wuxi is adjacent to, um, and who had the cur so he had the courage to, to um, lead a number of boatsmen smuggling to avoid the Japanese. Um, but then in 1941, one early one morning, he was discovered and shot at 
eight men were killed, their corpses sunk to the bottom of the, the lake and were never discovered. Uh, so we, se we get the sense of the emergence of the wartime narrative in these post-war genealogies as well um, as a way of dealing with this kind of difficulty of returning. Um, the last thing I want to mention about, um, about returning also is this is, there are acts in which people who were away during the war and people who were there during the war become bound together, sometimes quite inadvertently, um, by burial according to site. Um, and this is something that's, that's much more nebulous to link in, in, to make a claim for a link in the consciousness of the people at the time. But we can see it when we do a, a kind of uh, analysis of the geography of the area. Um, the example from Wuxi is that, um, as in many other areas of occupied China, uh, burial grounds and ritual spaces were set up um, by the officials who were working with the Japanese during the wartime um, and given the name either burial grounds for or shrines for wandering ghosts, for wandering spirits. Um, and these are, these are very interesting and the fact that they're given these names um, is worth some unpacking, maybe I'll leave the unpacking or, or for mutual discussion in the Q&A. Um, there's some very famous uh, ones in Nanjing and you can see the, the, um, the uh, um, memorial um, uh, tablets for those in the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Museum. Um, but the idea that there were all these nameless dead um, at, and dead at the hands of the Japanese soldiers that had to be accounted for um, somehow by, um, by the local officials who were caught in this position of being between the Japanese and the locals, um, and that they would do so by honoring um, the potentially extremely destructive nature of these people who had been, who had been killed as unsettled wandering ghosts. Um, it's quite interesting. I don't think you see very many other examples of this in Chinese conflicts. Um, so there was one such area in Wuxi. And um, after people returned, there was an enormous num uh, amount of contagious illness. And people had to be, um, and the government um, in 1946 was trying to find out a way to bury all the returnees who were falling victim to um, contagious illness in refugee camps. And they settled on a, a burial place adjacent to the site for um, the wandering dead during the war. So people became linked in the place that they were buried even as anonymized, uncared for dead as well. This is in contrast to some of the things that the government was trying to do in terms of um, commemoration and um, linking, making a system of loyal martyrs under the nation state. And, uh, and, is, and this is a kind of system that, that is much more familiar in historic narrative of the 20th century all around the world, that you, um, you select particular war dead, you put them in a memorial, you honor them, and you, um, you have gov high government officials um, commemorate them. So there was this sense um, for the nationalists that they would do this. There was an attempt um, that, didn't, that wasn't executed to build a war martyr shrine in the wartime capital of Chongqing. And the fact that um, that is very tied to the nationalists and also the persona of Chiang Kai-shek is notable in, this is the schem schematic drawn by the architect, but if you can see the main figure here, um, any of you who have ever seen a picture of Chiang Kai-shek during the war know that this is like how he walked around with this big long cape. Um, so it's clearly an outline of Chiang Kai-shek um, there. So he started to be um, designated as main officiant uh, in 
the, um, in the schema of honoring these loyal martyrs. At the, me at the same time, there were others who thought that, um, that actually, even in his own army, who thought that they should be honored more by, um, by uh, the individual unit, or even the province from which they hailed, or by their family. Um, so this was a contrast. By the time of the move to Taiwan, it was actually even more explicit. So here it says um, the president. Um, and at that point, the president was only Chiang Kai-shek, um, uh, was the main officiant in, before the uh, altar and the tablets, the spirit tablets of the, um, of the war dead. So I just, I, I want to um, come back to, to end with this last um, issue of how, when you have this kind of situation um, of, the, of a state wishing to, um, to make more orderly, the dead, um, to select the dead, and to take um, the ritual authority away from their fam the families and away from the localities to an ever-increasing extent, how families and, and actually the destabilizing presence of the dead can speak back. And for that, I'll go back to the, um, to the example of the uh, Dachan refugees um, and the first Taiwan Strait crisis. So. I'll skip over a couple. Um, I think we can think of these people as existing in a very loose network of living and dead versus the Wuxi people are existing in a pretty tight network, a well-organized network of native place. And in some sense, especially when we think of the coffin shipments, that's kind of a a well-organized network of, of corpses. Um, this is a loose network because the people from Da Chun were, um, were poor fishermen. Um, they spoke a local dialect that was a minority dialect within, even among Zhejiang people. Um, so, um, so you see Da Chun Island and then Yijiang, Yijiang Shan, which was the actual site of the battle. Um, here again, Yijiangshan, and then the two Dachan Islands. Um, so this was the site, the majority population center, and the site of the battle. Um, so the um, it was the prospect of integrating them into Taiwan um, Taiwanese society on any in any of its various configurations, Taiwanese. Um, in any um, definite, any sense of Taiwanese or a mainlander was quite difficult. Um, there was an attempt to register people before they were brought over um, because they were not even well integrated into the Republic of China, um, to the nationalist governmental system before the crisis erupted and they were brought. So they had to be kind of made into citizens beforehand, issued travel documents and so on. Um, but then they became, high, as I said, highly mediated by any number of photographers, not just from the West and the United States, but that had gone along with nationalist forces um, to the islands, were brought on American ships, but then distributed uh, rations by Madame uh, Chiang Kai-shek, by Song Mei Ling, and um, by Madame Zhang Jingguo, her daughter-in-law. Um, and recorded, this was recorded um, and um, distributed widely, and you can still find these books everywhere. Um, again, the daily life of these people um, and their otherness was pointed out, um, so much so that, that um, they were, this, you know, they needed, it was thought that they needed to be disinfected by DDT while on shipboard or at one, when art arriving at the dock in Taiwan. Um, but they also, particularly the widows of the guerrilla fighters um, who had been killed, 700 of 1,000 of them had been killed during this battle. 
um, brought with them their grief um, and the prospect of oftentimes leaving the corpses of their, um, the dead behind. So, um, and since this had been seen as an important battle by the nationalists, this was actually a site of, extreme, of contention between the families who would, um, who would have been thought to have been the chief mourners, and especially because these were locally um, enlisted guerrilla fighters. These were not people who had been trained in um, military academies and trained through the nationalist system. Um, and so a battle between the families on the one hand and, the, um, and Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist um, system of mourning on the other. And it comes through most clearly in this not clear photo, um, but um, also frequently re reproduced, although not to the extent of the other more laudable images, um, from the first memorial service for the guerrilla fighters um, early on fe in February 1955. Um, the clear version of this photo is in the archives and cannot be reproduced because it belongs to the presidential archives. But um, so I've, you can, the um, extent of that, the confrontation comes through a bit more even in that. But here we have the families, the widows and children of the Yijiangshan fighters facing Chiang Kai-shek. And again, if you've seen pictures of Chiang Kai-shek or you have any familiarity with what he should look like, this is not how he usually looks. This is far more discomfited than I've ever seen. Maybe, Emily, you've seen him look like this, than I've ever seen him look. Usually he has perfect posture. Um, he never betrays any sense of emotion like that on his face. Um, and you have these women. This woman here always strikes me. In the original photo, you can see the redness and, of her face and, and the tears on her cheek. Um, and in the back are um, our nationalist um, younger officials wearing the official mourning garb of the New Life Movement. Um, so the political, cultural movement of the time. And so the official mourning garb was to wear the white flower and uh, a, a Western suit for men or a dark blue chi pao for women. Um, but these um, women and children are wearing local mourning garb from, from Yijiangshan, from that part of Zhejiang and Dachan. Um, so you can see here like the rough woven cloth hood and so on. And so to me in this photo, this is, this is a, a confrontation of styles of mourning, but it's also a confrontation of responsibility um, and, um, and the, the absence of the, the dead, uh, but also the very real presence of the dead. Um, th by the next year, the next memorial service, the families were not so present at all. They had been shunted off to the side and the memorial, the main officiants were not even these New Life Movement people. They were there, but it was military personnel, uniformed military personnel. And so there was a sense of, of um, pushing forward um, the state and military narrative and pushing the families to the side. Um, this was seen as important to, I think, to the narrative of, of encouraging mainlanders in Taiwan to settle. This is actually a moment of transition in the nationalists in Taiwan where 1954-55 was the year in which um, Chiang Kai-shek decided to allow the rank and file of the military to marry. Before, until 1954, they had not been allowed to marry. Um, and so this was a moment of transition in thinking about retaking the mainland, in thinking about Taiwan as the last bulwark. Um, and so Da Chen became a symbol, and Yi Zhangshan became a symbol of this for the larger population. Uh, plays were written about Da Chen, and, um, and the, um, so this one, which I'll leave you with, 
in my conclusion, um, is one such example of this written by a playwright named Gao Qian, who went on to write for TV and uh, teleplays and some um, film scripts. But this was um, a stage play and um, it narrates the story of this family whose parents are conservative and then there are um, children who want to go out and fight the commie bandits, as they call them. Um, and um, and the, in this exchange, some of the, the younger children who have gone out, especially the, da the, the daughter who has uh, thrown in her lot as a nurse for the, um, for the army, has, is missing. Um, but the family wants to, the parents want to stay. So the father says, you know, I'm just going to stay here. This is our land. It doesn't matter. The mother says, you know, we have property. She's seen as like this old-fashioned, you know, a money-hungry woman. Um, but the father says, you know, in Daochen is property given to us by our ancestors. It has our lineage tombs. We cannot abandon our lineage tombs here in Daochen. Going back to this idea that any place that does not have your ancestors is not home. Um, and then they cry, and then they say, well, you, we still haven't found, they think the sister is dead. Spoiler alert, she's not dead. Um, your big sister's corpse is still missing. You want to abandon her and go. And then there's these great lines. Dad, mom, don't be upset. We are only leaving for now, and we will fight our way back. Who wants to leave his hometown and leave the old place? I believe that our government suffers unfathomably, and that the president's heart is certainly heavier than ours. They found a way to bring us to Taiwan. President Zhang will find us a way to bring, bring us back, essentially. So you know, translating the grief of the family into the grief of the, the, the government and, and, um, and you know, in, pers uh, in the person of President Zhang, and also that, oh, we'll go back. And this was interestingly performed not so much for Dachan people. This was performed in front of military audiences, full stop, just like any part of the nationalist military. So there was it was clearly being used as a trope to kind of um, enlist and mobilize further. Um, when Chiang Kai-shek died, um, a number of people in Taiwan noted the people from Da Chun wept extremely hard, notably hard. And they were portrayed on TV, old women weeping for Da Chun. Um, a number of people have since told me, though, that particularly some of the women, when they were weeping, said, um, spoke, were speaking, and they said, you promised to bring us home, and now you've gone to and died and not brought us back. <laughs> um, so there is still an exchange, a relationship here, and the relationship becomes particularly potent at moments of death when people use it as a moment of not just of symbolism, yes, but also of exchange, um, an exchange of power. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I really welcome your discussion and questions. psychological individual that knows no time or place. And you said your work doesn't quite connect with that literature. Are you finding a different psychological in individual in this time and place because of its culture and circumstances? Or, or is it the, you also allude to the, the, the way that people communicate their feelings. Is, is, is the communication the, the problem? Or is there actually a different psychology of trauma and grief at work here? Yeah, I mean, this is something I'm, I'm, I'm really, working through at the moment, so, so I, pre I really appreciate that question. And especially that the, you're putting it in the terms of the individual, because I think that, I mean, one's, one certainly can find individual accounts. And like, you know, so if you look at these, the accounts of, um, well, uh, for example, um, I'm thinking of, uh, there's a, recent book by Keith Chopa, um, in, the sea of, in a Sea of Bitterness, I think is the, the title, of, about wartime refugees. And he um, relies a lot on the writing of the artist Feng Zikai, um, who is his, uh, you know, fantastic writer, fantastic artist, um, uh, a, um, a 
you know, um, a very interesting Buddhist thinker, and so writes very, very thoughtfully about his experience. So, like, using people like that, we can get a sense of individual response and 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 you know, and some maybe trauma is appropriate, or maybe something else is appropriate. But um, I think we, you know, maybe we're just relying on on that approach alone is 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 not going to get us at this very large, you know, at the one quarter of the population. Um, and so that's why I'm interested in these ritual acts because one of the really interesting things about um, about what's going on in um, in Chinese cultural theory or a theory of uh, religion recently is, is the emphasis on, um, or even people who have using Chinese uh, religious theory to adapt more widely is thinking about ritual as a, um, I guess, as a way of thinking as much as as a way of doing. Like ritual as a reciprocal connection between people. And so that it is, another way of analyzing society and culture. Um, and so here I'm thinking of like the book Ritual and Its Consequences. Um, and so that, um, so we shouldn't necessarily concentrate uh, as only on belief and sincerity and, and those kinds of things. Um, but we should see the, um, the sincerity in the handshake, you know, the handshake establishes a, a ritual relationship between people. Um, so that's why I'm thinking of, you know, that um, burying, taking the care to bury someone and to move someone is an expression of emotion and social connectedness as much as writing about it. It's just, you have to figure out how to parse it and analyze it. In, in relation to memory and commemoration mm. and martyr shrines, when you use the term people, mm. I might understand that as men and women, or for all intents and purposes, this people mean men? Well, that is also a good, a good question. Um, sometimes, The martyr shrines on, for the government side, it is men, generally speaking, men commemorating men. Um, although with the war, this, there is an, an increasing effort, I think sometimes to include women in those, as the objects of commemoration in those shrines. Um, with the genealogies, um, most of the people writing them at this time are men. Um, and I was just looking at some notes I made where the, bio the, the subjects of the biographies include men and women. Um, but I was noticing that still, and I think that this reflects uh, maybe a sort kind of social con cultural conservatism on the part of these lineages in Wuxi still at this time, that women who lived through the war, who received a biography, who died during the war, tended to have less written about them, their wartime experiences than men did, which I think is not necessarily indicative of the fact that they, their lives were shaped by the war, it's sort of a gendered thinking about what war meant for, you know, who had agent, who was seen as having agency during the war by these lineages. So that's that's a, quite an interesting thing. Um, but in terms of um, who's getting moved around and buried, it's it's actually it's, it's mostly women who are being brought back, funnily enough. And I think that that goes to the circumstances of death. Like who's dying where, under what circumstances? But that's a good point that I should analyze more. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation.
situation. I, I, and I just wonder, uh, was the, did the nationalist government involved in the, uh, the shrine building? That in Chongqing, you mentioned that shrine, they mm -hmm. planted. I, uh, I found in Chiang Kai shek diaries. Mm -hmm. Chiang Kai shek know that there was a, uh, some, uh, his sub, uh, some of his subordinates did some uh, war memorial things, and he tried to stop it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the, the um, so maybe that's the flip side of some of the, the documents that I had seen. Um, and that's the debate about um, the local and the national and the, um, the unit. So like I had seen some documents where he had, actually, the, he had actually wanted to stop the building of ones by um, unit commanders or, or ones with a provincial identity. Because there were a whole bunch of plans for ones during the war and sometimes they wanted to honor, for, you know, like Hebei people who had died during the war. And most of them were military, but sometimes they would be um, civil service um, people in government who had been, you know, in working in in his in their his or her office. And then the uh, Japanese bomb comes and, and kills them. And he, yeah, the, so there was an effort to stop those because they were they had this. I guess you saw them either as having a local identity or maybe in terms of the military ones, it was not from the top, right? This is you know, insubordinate, military insubordination. I don't know, maybe you can, you have some ideas about that. <laughs> but, um, and so they, the, the reason they wanted to build the one in Chongqing was that it would be a central one. There was a lot of argument about this actually because they thought, well, is this actually undercutting the role of Nanjing as our real capital if we build this War Memorial Shrine in, Chong, in Chongqing, which is only really the secondary capital, the temporary capital. Um, but, so, but then he said, well, no, but we, it's important enough. We still need to do it. Um, but then the war ended before they finished it. So. Yeah. Well, how, do these, how do these issues play out on the communist side? I mean, I, I realize territorial issues are very different in terms mm -hmm. of the displacement and so forth. But in terms of the corpses and you said Sorry, on the on the communist side yeah. did you say? I mean is this a distinct kind of countercultural survival, these attitudes or um, uh, among conservative presumably more conservative group of people politically and so forth? Mm. Well one of the things that I see is that um, during the Civil War periods, um, so I mean, my my sense is uh, first of all, I should say my sense is skewed because of the the geographic area that I work on. So right. since I don't work on on North China, I don't know how it plays out there as much. Um, but one of the things that I see during the Civil War period in this. Um, in the territory that's always being switched back and forth between the communists and the nationalists, is that um, corpses also are, um, they're kind of um, objects of suspicion and sometimes even like political battles. So when, um, when living people, living refugees are coming or even um, living people and bodies are, are fleeing, from one side of the front lines to another, both sides are equally capable of, use, of using them as, um, as kind of you know, pawns in their political game. So there are some, um, so like anything can be accused of being an agent. So a living person, even like an old lady, can be accused of, if you're a refugee, can be accused of being an agent because you'd be like, using your status as an old lady to smuggle a gun or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, a dead pig or a cow can be accused of being an agent because there are stories of like a cow's being split open and, and grenades being sewed in and then they sew the cow up. Um, but similarly, a corpse, particularly in this area where, the, where it's coffins, it's not bones in an urn, but like whole coffins, um, there are stories of either the communists smuggling weapon, weapons and coffins or vice versa. 
So that also leads to, um, to some arguments from, I guess, both sides you see arguments that, like, how dare you would say that we would desecrate the dead? Um, so actually, the communists, you know, some of the communists um, take it as seriously as the nationalist side, too. Um, and also, one of the things that makes it um, methodologically difficult to find out what happened to people, the, dead, the ordinary dead during the war with Japan, is that in the, um, in the material that has been produced, the oral histories and recorded oral histories that's been produced since the 1980s about the, um, the Japanese war era, um, there's, there, when you look up material about burial, there's a, there's a distinct strand of heroic tale wherein um, local people are commemorated for having put themselves at risk to bury the body of a guerrilla fighter who had sacrificed himself or very occasionally herself against the Japanese. So that is, there is a trope in, in communist heroic lore about that's like a, a, you know, a kind of auxiliary heroic act, the burial of the, the freedom fighter kind of thing. Uh, so um, just to follow up, is there, so is there any evidence of, after 1949 in the mainland, mm -hmm. a, an effort being made to repatriate uh, to their, I mean, not to the, another country, but I mean uh, to the, home, the hometown people who have been um, uh, buried in, in, in other places? Was that part of, and was that part of the kind of reconstruction of China in uh, relative peacetime after, after 1949? Or was that, were all those attempts uh, kind of abandoned and there was no effort made to, uh, to, to bring uh, corpses back to their, to their hometown? I haven't seen anything about that. If someone has, I'd love to know. But um, the, the, um, the only thing that I've been looking at is the extent to which um, uh, corpses were and coffins and burial sites were moved around as part of 1950s reconstruction in within a town. So I've been looking at Nanjing, as particularly the um, the Sun Yat-sen memorial site. Um, and what struck me as interesting is that it. I think this is this is consonant with everything that we're starting to understand about the 1950s in China. That it was that. Um, change was a lot more gradual than we understand and that, that um, social reform and, um, and all kinds of economic reform were not um, overnight in 1949. So that um, there, was a, there was a big problem, you know, the problem with the, the, that memorial site was that even during the nationalist era, it was supposed to be a big garden and showcase around where, where Sun Yat-sen was buried. And that for the most part, unless you were a national hero, no one else was supposed to be buried there. But there were farming communities around there. There were villages, so people had burial grounds. And so th even after 1949, there was a continual problem of local people burying their dead in, within the precincts of that park. And it really wasn't until 1956 or, or so, 57, that the government um, really got people to stop doing it and that they moved they actually moved some coffins out for some large-scale projects, some agricultural pro projects. Um, so even, even the early PRC, they were not so keen to make people move coffins, at least in Nanjing, I don't know, in other cities. I suspect it was a very local thing. Yeah. <coughs> was there any class differentiation at all in the cultural practices of genealogy making and uh, the, the obsession with, with family continuity and so forth? Or is this a, a really a universal cultural practice? Oh, I, yeah, I, I would say this certainly this is a privilege of, well, it's a privilege of, of the elite. Um, although you can be, um, you can be part of, included in the lineage and not be wealthy. Um, and certainly you can also start off and not be elite or not be wealthy and be part of the lineage and then drop down. But the people who are composing the, the, the genealogy are either 
um, our elite or our self-styled elite in, in that sense that they want to. That's part of becoming an elite is that you take part in the compilation of the genealogy. Um, but um, the funny thing is that, that I think some people also use it as a way to, uh, to get in on this cultural reconstruction sometimes. So and the example I would use is from Taiwan. So you get all these, these compilation of genealogies in Taiwan among people who come from the mainland, but they're much more expansive. They're much more uh, claimed um, common lineage. So whereas these genealogies that I've been citing from are very specific, you know, like X lineage from X village in X county, um, you know, very, very particular. In Taiwan, you get these, some of these ones that are the Huang family from all of China. So it's like you really have to create a kind of, I mean, it's much more like fictive kinship because people have come from all over the place and they want to, cl they want to make a, a, this cultural claim. Um, so then it becomes much less elite, I would say. It's just people from all over and all stations of life. So it's really interesting how the practice of genealogy shifts. And now it, it actually is an, is an act of upward social mobility, I think. There's a revival in, in genealogy, writing, and lineage organization. <coughs> story, The Corpse Walker, which is the title of the story of a, a collection of uh, narr narratives uh, embellished factual uh, reportage literature by Liao Yiwu. Uh, in the Swalker uh, account, Liao is, is repeating something, he's narrating something he's heard from someone else with, with uh, some skepticism, but seeming to want to believe that uh, there was a, an important practice that continued until recent times, maybe into the 80s and 90s, of um, two guys who had this as their occupation carrying a corpse uh, hundreds of kilometers only at night <laughs> going from village to village mm -hmm. because the practice was was had been prohibited and um, they were doing this for a client and they they had clients still so they were carrying a woman a, f a female corpse so <laughs> could you interpret that story according to your <laughs> <laughs> um, your um, uh, working through these concepts and applying it to mm. uh, yeah, Chinese I've been avoiding interpreting that story. <laughs> yeah. okay, well, maybe you don't want to, um. but <laughs> uh, let me th oh, let me think. Um. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no. that, um, I'm still thinking it through. Yeah. There's still echoes because the, the Corpse Walker book was published about five years ago. Yeah. Uh, the story was written two years earlier in China. Yeah. The English translation was published five years ago. And, and Liao was considered a dissident author. He walked his way out of China, walked across the border, and ended up in China. So he received quite a bit of attention. And he, he, his subject matter is weird popular practices to some extent, the underside of Chinese society. I mean, that's a, I mean this, this is what I was, I was trying to formulate a, a, a sentence out of these kind of inchoate thoughts, which is um, how, in a way, I mean, this is, and this is why I haven't, I haven't quite put it all to get put together what he's writing about, and then our understanding of, um, <laughs> Which is, which is, you know, sort of odd and or, or described as as odd, and it is odd in a sense um, or unusual. And like, how do we put it together with our sense of from from what we know about these, you know, migration patterns and everything? The fact that that um, it was. Customary, which doesn't mean you know, it's the fact that something is customary doesn't mean that you know, that 
it's not seen as, um, uh, I don't know what would be the right word, um, uh, uh, something that people are, are comfortable with in a part of everyday life, but customary that bodies get moved around or bones get moved around. You know, that, so in southern China where people still practice and in, in, in Taiwan still very much practice or, or Hong Kong, secondary burial. So it's still very customary that there are ritual specialists who know how to disinter bodies, clean bones, put them back together, wrap them up specially, do the ritual for secondary burial. It's customary, but that doesn't mean that everyone wants to hang out with that ritual specialist and watch them do it and see it. You know, this is, so it's a, it's a spe he's a specialist for a reason, right? So, but, so the, but these things are customary and they're known about it and you know, people know that there is a person to go to for that practice, that you hire ritual specialists. So what I'm thinking about is like how we get from that scenario, social scenario, to what he's writing about, which is, this is strange, this is odd, there are these people who do this and it's really like peculiar and I'm gonna write about it and, and because it's so peculiar, and then it becomes a symbol of, of something. Um, and I'm, I don't know what he wants it to be a symbol of, I wouldn't presume to, you know. So there's a gap there, and, and we can say it's a gap of a number of things, whether it's a gap of, of, of uh, you know, a secularization of society, or it's a gap of, um, he's just using this to make a point, or is it, you know, a gap of, like, this is a particularly odd version of this practice that more normally get, you know, because of topography or whatever it is. So, I mean, and it, it, it does relate in that sense to something that I'm thinking about, which is um, how do these lines of, of transit and a sense of home that people have and, and what might be a more kind of um, typical networks, how do they get disrupted by the, um, by the events of the 20th century, by war, by nation state formation, by the, you know, we can use the word partition maybe of, of China, Japan. I mean, China and Taiwan, um, by, by all these forces. And so another exa you know, example would be, um, my understanding is from people who work on earlier Taiwan histories, um, that you know, there are a, a number of, uh, a large portion of the Taiwanese population, particularly if you're a wealthy or merchant, you, know, you came originally from Fujian. Um, and so some of those families still bur maintained burial grounds in Fujian. So in the late 19th, early 20th century, it is pra would be practice of some of them to actually send bones back for burial in Fujian. Um, and that was a process that was disrupted by 1949, um, by the split. So those families could no longer maintain those burial grounds. And that's a different population than the one I'm talking about of people who came in 1949 or 47 and were separated from their home and their, bur their home burial place. So there are all these lines of transit um, which are being disrupted by these forces of the 20th century. So that's, that's kind of how I'm putting it together is like how, how does that oddness develop out of something which maybe was more Maybe there are other way, there are all kinds of other ways that people move bodies around in the area that he's talking. He's writing about Sichuan mainly, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, besides just this carrying a corpse. So that's my thinking off the top of my head. Another question, sure. Yeah. yeah, thanks. I have a question about the, uh, your, your, your method about, mm -hmm. the, about, about trauma. Mm. Uh, I have uh, many, I found many people uh, have trauma, mm. but I don't know how to overcome it. Let people talk about the, uh, their hard harm on, yeah. on, on both sides, yeah. on the communist side, as well as the national side. 
when they are. Do you have any uh, tips, some? Um, no, I some don't. That's <laughs> why I'm doing this kind of analysis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, it's, uh, yeah, exa exactly. I mean, that's why I really started to think about this when I was, I was giving a talk and, um, and someone who works on na uh, uh, Native American history basically asked me, he's like, well, you know, like, how do you think you can, you can, it was, it was basically a question like, how could you get people to talk without, you know, re-traumatizing them? And I said, you know, it was the gist of the question. And I thought, yeah. This is, this is an important thing to think about, too, you know. Um, and that's when I really, st or, you know, forcing them into some sort of, some sort of line of thinking, which is not, um, didn't necessarily make sense. I mean, this is, this is something we talk, you know, you always talk about when you think about oral history or something. Um, and and um, is how to let, ask questions but then let the, the interview proceed uh, somewhat naturally. It's, um, and I've only done very little bit of oral history so far. Um, time is running out, so I need to get on that quick. But um, this is, uh, I mean, this is why I'm thinking about doing these other kinds of analysis as well. Um, this kind of analyzing um, action and ritual as well as speech. Um, it seems to me that <coughs> maybe it'll work, maybe it'll not. It's a very helpful thing to be um, examining the war in China as death and displacement and, and remembering that for most of human history, war has been more about death and displacement because it, it, when it occurs in, in an undeveloped economy, mm -hmm. there, it, it's, it's more, so much more deadly. So China yeah. was you know, not a very developed. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, it was uh, this, uh, such a huge, uh, much more of a huge social impact than yeah. uh, modern military history takes into account normally. Uh, so rewriting the history of war in China as a social, social yeah. as a person, as a big set of traumatic personal experiences is a helpful way to frame it for everyone. You know that you're not talking to, yeah. <laughs> and who aren't talking to anybody, just to, yeah. to remember to. And one of the, yeah, exactly, and one of the problems is too that, um, I mean, sometimes in written sources, particularly like, uh, you know, standard written sources, the description of suffering and pain is, um, it, there is a, um, this is, it's a certain set of language of, of phrases and language that that um, that people use, and historically this is true. So, I mean, for example, um, famine um, and you know, things like famine and and everyone's um, the, the oft returned to topic of cannibalism, um, which comes up in topics ranging from Taiping Rebellion to flooding in the 20th century and so on. And, um, and you know, when sometimes when you read 20th century sources or 19th century sources, they're very um, heart-rending descriptions, but then you start to see the language repeat, and the bodies hanging from trees, dogs eating corpses, um, these things, which is not to say that these are not they're used because they're seen as having meaning, and they're seen as a, a, a set of, of phrases that um, that carries a, a, um, a kind of social resonance. But for a historian, how do you interpret that in a specific setting, specific to time and place? Um, it becomes, to me, it becomes very difficult. Um, you know, when you're trying to to get at some set of social fact. Um, and so this is why this is um, something I try to think about too, is how do you get away from a kind of standardized description of suffering? Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you very much, I appreciate it.